All right. And we are back. We are back. Welcome, welcome to the Biblos Network. We are excited that you are here with us. This week's session is going to be a good session. I believe God is going to help us. He's going to strengthen us. There's no telling what God will do when you unleash the power of God in your life. It's been a great week here in Durham, North Carolina. It has been hot. It has been hot for the last month, working our way through the dog days of August. Um, But spiritually speaking, there has been a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We've had many people baptized, many people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I cannot express how many of you have contacted us, and we're delighted that you have. We have people from Italy. We have people from Jamaica. We have people from um, Eastern Europe, all over the place that are contacting us. You're giving us feedback. And that's not to mention the people in the States. We're so glad that you have. We're excited about it. God's doing great things. And we're, we're excited to explore the Word of God with you. We do get topical ideas. And one young man here today asked me, if I would do a session, one session on baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and another person contacted us and asked if I would do one on Romans 10, the Roman road, which is where people get the phrase, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. So we're going to tackle that. Um, over these next couple sessions, um, we're going to talk about baptism and why people think that you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and they frame it the way that they do. So so it's going to be good. It's going to be great. And so this, this session is one, hopefully it can edify you personally. Maybe there's some scriptural dynamics that it can help sharpen how you view the Word of God. But this is also one that you can forward to your friend that coworker of yours that you've been trying to explain it, maybe you haven't been able to explain it quite as well as you want to. They have questions. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? I hope that these next couple sessions, you will be able to forward them to people and say, here, listen to this. This is what the Bible says. This is how, this is how we see this. So in particular, I want to talk first about baptism. Why do apostolic people get so serious about baptism, and in particular, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ? It's a big topic, and we're going to walk through it today. Um, I think this will edify. It will also evangelize. So if you're out there and you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, I'm going to explain why we do it, why it's such a big deal, and why it is such an identifying trait and characteristic in the apostolic world. Indeed, in Christianity, it's supposed to be a premier identifying trait. Um, so I guess I'll start out by, by saying we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ because the Scripture teaches us, and we believe this, that a person will not go to heaven unless they are baptized in Jesus' name. The Scripture teaches in John Chapter 3 and verse 5, that except a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the moment I say that, there's going to be a howl from the denominal world of, that, that has come through um, not centuries, not decades, not centuries, but millennia of misinformation and dogma and ideology. They gotta, you have to wade through it all, and, and it confuses people. But if you just go to the Bible— that, that John 3, 5 paradigm, a paradigm is just a big fancy word that means a way of looking at things, so your worldview, a paradigm, a book of Acts paradigm makes all the difference in the world. So we're going to look at the New Testament through the lens of the book of Acts. We're not going to look at it through a Calvinist mindset, through a Catholic mindset, through a denominal, you know, Baptist, Assembly of God, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran mindset. We're going to look at it through a Book of Acts original mindset. So why why do we baptize in Jesus' name? Well, the Bible tells us to. The Scripture actually records no other method of being baptized. Now, there's a, the reaction to that is it's it's varied. A lot of people would 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 take issue with that to some degree or another. They would say, well, you don't even need to be baptized. It's not a big deal. We're saved by grace through faith. Um, 
and that's not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's it's a gift of God. And what they're doing is they're reciting a Lutheran, a, a Reformation mantra that that Martin Luther taught um, that it's only by grace, by faith, nothing else is necessary. The truth is Martin Luther was a, a Catholic monk who was translating the scripture. The Catholic Church was so works heavy and so uh, relic heavy and b- bound by and weighted down by superstition and tradition that when he chose to break away from them and to protest them, becoming the first Protestant, that he swung the pendulum of his life the whole completely different other way. And he got, a, he, he got rid of and eliminated all action on the part of the believer. And that is a, a Lutheran ideology. It is a, a um, religious denominal ideology. It is not a scriptural ideology. Now, you can cherry pick scriptures that are in there. You can go into the epistles and you can find places where it says that you're saved by grace, you're saved by faith. Um, and you could keep looking in James. It says you're saved by works. <laughs> so uh, what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to go to the book of Acts and we're going to look at that, a snapshot of the book of Acts. And then we're going to say, just like they did it, We do it. This is how Peter, James, John, the original 12, this is how they did it. This is how Mary, the mother of Jesus, did it. They were all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Um, Now, before I launch into that, we, in our Line Upon Line series, we talk about Noah and we talk about Moses. Those two Bible accounts are premier in that they highlight the fact that you must go through the water to be saved. It's a shadow and type. It's a metaphor. It's an archetype that lets you know that if you want to be saved, you have to go through the water. And Peter taught this in 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21. Look it up. It's in your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. It says that this is a figure. That word figure means a metaphor or shadow or type. This is a figure by which baptism does also now save us. So Noah and the ark is a metaphor for salvation. And it says that eight souls were saved by water. So just like you could not be saved without going through the water in Noah's day, you can't be saved without going through the water today. And just like you couldn't come out of Egypt without going through the water, and the water buried your past The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, that they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And that is a powerful metaphor of us being baptized by the water and the spirit. That cloud and sea directly correlates to water and spirit, John 3, 5. If you lay John 3, 5 over the top of 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, you will find out that if you want to get out of Egypt, you got to go through the water and into the cloud just like they did. They were baptized unto Moses But we're baptized into a greater Savior in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, who not only saves your body, he saves your soul, your spirit, the whole man, the whole woman. So these are biblical metaphors, you know, ancient Old Testament descriptives. What we're going to do today is go to the New Testament, and we're going to see that, you know, some people think John 3, 5, to be born of the water, born of spirit, means that you're physically born and then you're spiritually born. Um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So what they say is, well, you have to be born physically. That's the first thing. Then you have to be born uh, supernaturally. That's the, that's to be born of the spirit. So born of the water means physical birth. And born of the spirit means spiritual birth. That is not what that means. Um, that is a complete uh, imposition of meaning onto the scripture. And we know this because the Bible is is replete with examples for us. In Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, and a host of other places, those are just the main ones off the top of my head, they were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. You'll find a water-spirit paradigm. You'll find that same thing in the Exodus. There's a water-spirit paradigm. They go through the water into the cloud. They are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost all through the book of Acts. And so to be born of the water and born of spirit needs to be interpreted with the scripture, not just arbitrarily saying one's physical, one's spiritual, and imposing your own view and uh, what they would call an eisegetical 
um, perspective means to impose a meaning onto the scripture. Let the scripture speak for itself. And when you get to the book of Acts, without exception, they were baptized and they received the Holy Ghost. Um, And that's the water spirit paradigm. So where we get that you are baptized in Jesus' name, when, when the apostles came and began to preach the gospel, of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which, by the way, is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. One is death, that's repentance. The burial is baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost is the resurrection. Um, That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's how you obey it, is by obeying Acts 2.38. When the apostles went to Jerusalem after Jesus had been crucified, he rose from the dead, he showed himself alive for 40 days, And if you do the math, he's dead for three days, he rises from the dead, he shows himself for 40 days, which is 43 days. Then for seven days, they continue in Jerusalem praying in one accord in one place. That leads us up to the 50th day, which is where we get the word Pentecost, 50. And there's a lot of symbology there and, and metaphoric teaching there, but ultimately the Holy Ghost is poured out. They speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. And when the people that were there, you can find this in Acts chapter 2, when the people were, that were there heard this, this original church, that was the birthday of the church, the first day the church ever existed on earth. You, what we do is we go to that original day and we say, if it was true then, it's true now. It hasn't changed. If it has changed, ask yourself, why has it changed? And the reason that it has changed is because religion got involved Catholicism got involved, denominalism got involved, and they they distorted and they perverted it. The original Book of Acts church, they taught baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And by the way, um, the Catholic Encyclopedia will bear this out. Historically, they um, are happy to point out that they did change the baptismal formula. Um, There's several encyclopedia, Catholic encyclopedias that readily admit this. They know it. It's a historical fact. They believe they have the power to do that as they got more information and more wisdom. We strongly reject that idea. We do not get more intelligent. The further from Jesus we get, (laughs) we need to go back to that original early church and we need to find out how they baptized and we need to duplicate that today. And one big reason is there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so when the Jews that were gathered there asked the question, this is in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up, he preaches Jesus. They ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter preaches about Jesus, how they had taken him, and by wicked hands they had slain him. They had crucified him, the Lord of glory. And then when you get up to 2, 36, 37, and 38 of Acts chapter 2, the Scripture tells us that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said one to another, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter's answer was simple. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is water and spirit. And he tells them to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus told his disciples how to fulfill the Great Commission. You'll find it in Matthew 28. You'll find it in Luke 24. You'll find it in Mark 16. And at the end of the book of John, you'll find little references alluding to it. But John's a little different. It's not what we call one of the synoptic gospels. It's written a little differently. But you'll, you'll find that great commission in Matthew, Mark, and Luke very readily where Jesus tells them how to go into the world and he tells them how to baptize. Now what the denominal world did, and this is, this is intricately tied into why we do not subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that there are three persons in God. They work together as one, and as oneness believers, we teach that that word 
persons does violence to the idea of God's singularity, his monotheism, his oneness. We don't believe God can be broke into three persons. We do believe that there are three manifestations, three aspects of God. We do allow for a distinction between the humanity of Jesus Christ that had a separate will uh, from the divine spirit so that he could say, not my will, but thy will be done. We do make allowance for that. We see that in the scripture. But the doctrine of the Trinity, one of its great misfortunes is that it undermined the doctrine of baptism. It changed it. It morphed it. And so to accommodate a false doctrine, the early Catholic Church decided they would change the way they baptized, and they freely admit to it. Because they had papal authority to do it, they could issue uh, decrees and papal bulls. They could say, well, we'll just change it. We have more revelation. We have more insight now, and so we'll get together and we'll change how we baptize because, after all, since there's actually three and not really one, then, you know, you can't leave the other two out. And there you can see those early tritheistic leanings. They tried very hard to bridge that to maintain some sense of monotheism, but it ultimately lends itself to and leans toward um, a, a, a plurality of at least persons and even gods if it's taken to its furthest extreme. So now, instead of baptizing in the name of Jesus, they are baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Most of the denominal world does that. And if you go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says this, 18 and 19. He says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He he is describing how that all authority has been delivered to and given to the man Christ Jesus. So it resides in Jesus Christ. He has the keys of death and hell. He has all power in heaven and earth. And he says, go you therefore. Now that therefore is a bridge to the fact that he has all power. And baptize. Go ye therefore into all the world, into every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That one phrase right there, The denominal world took that, they ran with that, and there's been a lot of controversy about that. People will will baptize that way. They won't give any thought to it. They're just doing what their church says to do. Nobody in the Bible ever did that, not in that form, not in that formula. And there is a formula. And for everybody that says, well, it doesn't matter how you're baptized because it's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus— well, if it doesn't matter, if, if it does not matter how you're baptized, then, then baptism is non-essential, which is not a scriptural doctrine. If you say, well, the formula of Jesus' name doesn't matter, then no formula matters. You could baptize in the name of the day spring, the author and finisher of our faith, and the alpha. <laughs> um, you could baptize in the name of the lamb, the day star, and the bishop of our souls. But God did not do that. He said to baptize them, and any apostolic worth their their salt will tell you this, in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, we know that that is a singular name. You can conjugate that. um, You can break it down, and you'll find out that the name is a singular uh, idea and concept. There is one name, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the the Scripture backs this up and bears this out. But what's more important uh, than that is Mark and Luke do as well. Mark and Luke both contain the same Great Commission where these other men heard the same words and they wrote them down as they heard them. And it's amazing to me that people will major on Matthew's words and try to force a Catholic ideology, and then finally a denominal ideology onto it. When you go to Mark, and the Bible says in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Jesus said in my name. They will cast out devils. They will lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. Um, 
so he he spoke of doing things in his name in the same area that he is describing baptism. Luke chapter 24 tells us, verse 47, that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name, the name of Christ, beginning at Jerusalem. So Mark and Luke both bear witness to what Matthew did, that the idea is the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you've got pen and paper, write this verse down, Luke, or rather, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. Peter is telling them that that Jesus Christ is the stone that was set at naught of you builders. He was put aside. He was dismissed. He was not valued. He was set at naught of you builders. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, there's a lot of people that want to dismiss the power of the name, and that's very interesting because they don't do that when it comes to healing or when it comes to casting out devils, or when it comes to any exercise of the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. You never see anybody casting out devils in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You never see where they say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, rise up and walk. You'll never see that because they always knew there was power in the name. And that Old Testament name had great authority to where you were not to take that name in vain. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. He changed uh, Edom's name to Esau. He changes uh, Jacob's name to Israel. He changes Sarai's name to Sarah. On and on and on. These names carry great weight in the Hebrew mind and in, in that Middle Eastern mindset. So for Americans and Western educated people to summarily just dismiss the power of that name is to miss the richness and the power of the name of God which is Jehovah's salvation, Yeshua, HaMoshea, Jesus the Christ, that his name is to be spoken in baptism. And further, not only do Mark and Luke testify, and Matthew says that it's to be done in the name, the singular name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but when you get to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38, we see that they baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you go back just a little bit earlier in that chapter, when they asked, what in the world does this mean? People were there and they said, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Peter, the Bible says, standing up with the 11. Take note of that. He stood up with the 11. What a great opportunity to to point out his error. What a great time for Matthew to say, whoa, 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 Pete. Hey, wait, wait, bub. Look, hey, look, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Remember, that's what it was. You're getting this twisted. <laughs> but Matthew was consenting to what Peter said because Matthew knew what he said. It was the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So they baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. They baptized Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus puts his name upon them and and all of the efficacious, redemptive, uh, the, the reconciliation elements of his atoning sacrifice is then delivered through his name and through his spirit by baptism and by the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not the only place. This is why we have to look at the scripture through the lens of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the only historical narrative of the early church that we have. There are people that jump into Romans First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. They try to jump into there as letters and epistles to the church, but, but they then twist and rest those scriptures. They try to make them say things they don't say. They overlook the historical narrative of what the church actually looked like, what they actually did. So nobody ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Those words were never uttered over someone. It was always the name of Jesus. So we go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and this is where Philip goes down to Samaria, and he preaches to the Samaritans, and they believed him. Simon the sorcerer had bewitched them, and, and Philip comes preaching Jesus, and they believed Philip. The Bible says unclean spirits came out with a loud voice. Um, they believed uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
there was great joy in that city. Um, and the Bible says that they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But they had not received the Holy Ghost. So, so for everyone that wants to try to say that um, not only, and some people feel this way, they feel that you receive the Spirit when you are baptized. And um, they'll point to Jesus going down to the Jordan River where when he goes down there, uh, John baptized him and the heavens were open, the Holy Ghost came down. And they want to say that's one event. So it's one thing. The moment you get baptized, that's when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And that's not true. In Acts chapter 8, they were baptized. The whole city was baptized in Jesus' name, but the Bible says none of them had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they call for Peter and John. And this is found in verses 14 and 16 of chapter 8. They call Peter and John, who, when they came down, laid hands on them, and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there again, we have the water spirit paradigm. Um, this is a healthy way of looking at the Scripture. Um, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. We now see it happen in Acts 2, and now we see it happen in Acts 8. Born of the water, born of the Spirit, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. That water spirit paradigm is the, um, it's the book of Acts template. And they're baptized in Jesus' name. And it shows the distinction between baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If it was all one event, it never would have said they had only been baptized. It would have said they, it all happened at once, but it didn't. It takes great pains. The Bible, the apostles, Luke, the writer, takes great pains to illustrate that the Holy Ghost and baptism are separate, distinct experiences. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. Don't, don't miss that. So when Jesus goes into the Jordan River, that's not one just one event happening there. Jesus is showing that we are to be born of the water, and the Spirit as well. He's showing how it's going to be played out. Jesus is the ultimate template. And I could point out to you when John said, no, we shouldn't do that, Jesus tells him, I must fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus, who doesn't need baptism, and the Spirit of God dwelt in him already, doesn't need to do this for salvation's sake. He does it as a template for you and I to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had it happen we are to have it happen. So we then go to Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles. This is to Cornelius' house. And, and take the time to read the chapter. It's a very enriching, enlightening portion of Scripture where finally the Gentiles are going to have access into the kingdom of God. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those that sat in the shadow of death are going to be enlightened. And it's Cornelius. Cornelius is praying. He is a devout man. He, he prays always. He gives alms to the people. An angel appears to him. I mean, this guy is, he is a very dedicated, consecrated man. He's probably dedicated than a lot of people who claim Christianity. And Cornelius is there seeking the face of God. An angel appears to him. And says, thy prayers, thine alms are come up as a memorial before God. Send men to Joppa. Call for one whose, si whose surname is Peter. One Simon whose surname is Peter. Uh, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now, that's in Acts 10. You'll find that. The angel says, he will tell thee what you ought to do. Now, when you read it, you ought to do in the old King James. It kind of, you know, you could say, the way we use ought to do, you could you could maybe interpret that as, yeah, you should get around to this. Yeah, you really ought to. Hey, you don't have to, but yeah, it might be a good idea. In between, you know, running to McDonald's and getting a little gas in your car, yeah, you ought to. Yeah, just check it out. <laughs> well, so don't misinterpret that. Uh, the angel was giving a very powerful admonition. I mean, this is a heavenly emissary. This is a messenger from heaven, and he's coming down to Peter, and he's telling him, uh, to Cornelius, Cornelius rather, telling him to call for Peter. This is, Peter's the man with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. So <clears throat> it is no coincidence that Peter opens the doors to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. He opens the door to every strata 
of scriptural people. And so it is fitting that Peter goes to the Gentiles because he has the keys. And the keys are the new birth. It's the gospel. It's Acts 2.38. That's the keys. Now, if you read this exact same portion of Scripture in Acts 11, just jump one chapter later, Peter has got to stand before the Jewish council. He's nervous because he knows they're going to be upset he went to talk to Gentiles. They're going to say, why in the world did you go talk to these Gentiles? You shouldn't have. You shouldn't be doing that. And so the Bible says he rehearsed the matter. He knew he was going to get called to the red carpet. He knew they weren't going to be happy about it. They were going to have quite a bit to say. And so Peter rehearses it in his mind. He gets ready. When he gets there, he tells them what happened. And when he does, he tells what the angel said. But this time when he says what the angel said, he words it different. He said that the angel looked at him and said that, Peter will come to your house and he will tell you, Cornelius, words by which you and all your house shall be saved. So Peter goes and he preaches the same message to Cornelius that he did to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He preaches Jesus. And when it's done, the entire house, the Bible says before he could even get the words out of his mouth, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and then Peter said, Can any man forbid water which, uh, that, that these should be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? They saw, the Jews that came saw that they received the Holy Ghost just like they did in Acts chapter 2. And so here we have again the water-spirit paradigm. They're baptized in Jesus' name again in, in Acts chapter 10. So these are just book of Acts examples. Now, when you get to Acts 16, um, it doesn't go into as great a detail, but when Paul deals with the Philippian jailer, the scripture says that he preached the gospel to him after the jail broke up and there was a great earthquake. And that night, um, they baptized that jailer and, and he and his family rejoiced. Now, rejoice is a little code word for the Holy Ghost fell on them. The Bible said that we would rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory so that when you see rejoiced, uh, for instance, the Ethiopian eunuch later on, Philip goes, and, and rather earlier in Acts 8, when after the Samaritan revival, Philip goes to the Ethiopian eunuch out in the desert. He baptizes him, and he goes his way rejoicing. Again, code word. They receive the Holy Ghost, water and spirit. They went down into the water. They baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, and... And he went his way rejoicing. All of these are the water spirit paradigm examples of the book of Acts. In Acts 2, 8, 10, and 19, it takes great pains to go into great detail. And I think Acts 19 is probably one of the most stark examples of the water spirit dynamic because Paul comes and finds certain disciples of John. Uh, just before that, Priscilla and Aquila had converted uh, Apollos. They, they showed him the way of God more perfectly. And for everybody that's out there that, that maybe has not been baptized in Jesus' name, you have never received the Holy Ghost, that does not negate your walk with God. It does not mean you don't have a walk with God. You do. God does speak to you. God does talk to you. He deals with your heart. He loves you. You have a relationship with him. But just like he did with Cornelius, just like he did with the Ethiopian eunuch, just like he did with Apollos, God wants to explain the way of God more perfectly. So Paul finds disciples of John who only knew John's baptism in Acts 19, 1-6. When he gets to them, he immediately asks them two questions. I want you to notice these questions. The first question was, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Ghost. And then once they said that, Paul kind of got an idea where they were at. He said, under what then were you baptized? Look at those two questions Paul comes out of the gate with. In essence, he's saying, have you been born of the water? 
Have you been born of the Spirit? First two questions. He checks the foundation. He quizzes them. Now, if it doesn't matter, why is Paul asking them that? Is Paul just frivolously, and we're talking about the greatest missionary apostle that has ever lived, <laughs> is Paul just arbitrarily just throwing some questions out there, bouncing them off people, it doesn't have anything else better to do? No, no, no. Every word in the Scripture matters and carries great weight. It is the revealed mind of God to man. And the first two questions he comes out with are, have you got the Holy Ghost and how are you baptized? And the reason he said that was because he wanted to see if they'd fulfilled the new birth. He wanted to see if the water spirit paradigm was alive in their life. And they said, we've only been baptized with the baptism of John. Once they said that, Paul said, John believed on him that was coming after him. That is on Jesus Christ. And he took them and baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterwards, they received the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Water and Spirit. Now, there's a host of other scriptures I could take you to. Um, I could take you to 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul asked the question, were you, uh, were you was Apollos greater than me? Was he great? Is he greater than Peter? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer, you know, that's a rhetorical question. No, they weren't. Paul's not greater. They were, Paul was not crucified. Jesus was. They were not baptized in the name of Paul, and it begs the question, well, then who, whose name are you baptized in? And they were baptized in the name of Jesus, not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, when you get to Romans chapter 6, they are baptized into Christ. Um, Galatians 3.27, as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Um, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12, they are, they are baptized with the circumcision of Christ. Um, they're circumcised with the circumcision, circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. So all of these scriptures are pointing that baptism is to be performed, and the one consistent element is in the name of Jesus Christ. And when you drape Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We must be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. There is legal authority in that name. There is inheritability in that name. You become an heir through that name. <clears throat> Folks, you need your name clear in your passport. You need it on your driver's license. You need it electronically. We live in a, in a time where, where inheritances are given. If you have the name, people take pains to get married so that they can get the right name and they can inherit, and it comes with certain legal dynamics, and they're willing to do that. The name carries such great weight, and that was the ancient form of that. God's name was sacred. He changed people's names to reflect their character. They were to remember the name of the Lord, to keep it holy. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And so when you take all of those Old and New Testament dynamics and you apply that to the name of Jesus Christ, that's why the Bible says it is a name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you get the name of Jesus, you are getting the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Trinity undermines that. It takes away the glorious revelation of the name of Jesus, and it, it diminishes it. It takes the New Testament salvation experience. It dulls it. It breaks it down. It makes it null and of none effect, and the name of Jesus matters. If every apostle was baptized in Jesus' name, shouldn't you? If the Catholic Church freely admits they changed that a couple of hundred years later, shouldn't that cause alarm bells in your mind? You can go to any Catholic encyclopedia. They freely admit to it. They believe that the Pope had the power to change the Scripture. Papal infallibility. I even read an article one time where it, it, it was pointing out that Scholars have to, they do have to admit it because it is historical record, that the New Testament church exclusively baptized in Jesus' name. And so the writer of the article said, well, it is true that in primitive Christianity, 
they did this. Now, I'd like to hit the, hit the pause button right there. The academic dishonesty, the breathtaking arrogance to call Jesus and the apostles primitive Christianity. You see the fallacy. I pray that you do. That means we are more enlightened than Jesus and the apostles. That means that I know more than Peter knew. I know more than James and John knew. The, man, the, the ones who walked with him and talked with him and, and lived with him and, and, and died martyrs' deaths. Primitive Christianity. There's a reason, ladies and gentlemen, that, that the apostles' names are in the foundation of heaven. We are not built on the foundation of John Calvin and Martin Luther and, and all of the, the litany of popes that went before them. We're not built upon the foundation of them. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that's who we build our life on. That's who we build our salvation on. And we follow their words because that's what the scripture teaches. It is the only biblical record. Oh, yes, I'm passionate about it. Apostolics are very passionate about it. We are people of the name. Okay, let's talk about the name a little further. This is becoming too obvious for comment now. People are learning that it is a fallacy to, to try to deny this. Um, we just recently learned that Franklin Graham is baptizing in Jesus' name. Marco Rubio understands Acts 2.38. He tweeted it out on Twitter. More and more people are coming to a, a revelation and understanding of the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the name Shem, you know, Ham, Shem, Japheth, it means name. It means name. And so the Shemitic people, or what today we would call the Semitic people, which became the Jews, the Arabs, the people of the Middle East, they all were the people of the name. And there's a spirit in this world that hates that. It hates that name. Jesus told them in Revelation over and over, you have not denied my name. You have kept my name. You've held fast to my name. Why would he say that? Because there was an anti-Shemitic, an anti-name, an anti-Semitic movement, spirit that was anti God, Antichrist, that was in the world. We see its fullest expression in, in Nazi Germany. We see it all throughout Scripture. Um, I, 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 the, the reformers, many of the reformers burned people who baptized in Jesus' name at the stake. And it blows my mind that today there's religions and denominations dedicated to them. And they were murderers. They were killers. History documents it. And so the more this comes out, the more educated we become, the more we realize that there's only one way to be baptized, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. It is the name that's above every name. We're passionate about it. It's the only place, only name in the book of Acts that is given uh, to us throughout the epistles. It's given to us, and it is, it is the name of Jesus Christ, and the Bible says it is for the remission of sins. So if you have never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, please Take the time. Find somebody that you know that you that you can go to. They will baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Find a church that baptizes that way. If you can't find them, come to Durham. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, and you will be following in the footsteps of that early New Testament church. It is not primitive. It's original. That word primitive, it, it raises the hackles on my neck because that word primitive makes you think of cavemen and sitting around a fire and gnawing on a bone and a loincloth. And now we're so enlightened, we're so educated. Folks, that early church, they knew what Jesus said. They saw the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. It was later that the great corruption came. It was later that the grievous wolves entered in, not sparing the flock. It was later through the councils and the creeds that they diluted and watered down and broke down the original message until it resembles nothing like that original book of Acts church. Go to Acts chapter 2 and ask yourself, does your church look like that? Is there any pope there? Is there any priest in confessional booth? Is there any holy water? Did you know that not one baby was ever baptized in the scripture, in the New Testament scripture? 
not for not for uh, the gospel's sake. There's no biblical record. Somebody asked me, why, why don't you do that? Well, because they never did it in the Bible. They, they would circumcise them in the Old Testament and in that ancient culture, but baptism was to be done by faith in Jesus Christ, and it was the circumcision of Christ, and it was to be done uh, with knowledge of what you were doing and faith in what you were doing. And so infant baptism is a later addition um, that the Catholic Church instituted. So you have to dig through layers and layers of commentary and uh, millennia of, of misinformation. And, and when you actually read the Bible, then you will find out baptism was always done in the name of Jesus Christ. So be baptized in Jesus' name, just like all of the apostles were, and you'll find the same blessing that they found. Thank you so much. God bless you. I look forward to talking to you next time.